the pieces together again. Hello. So how did you begin your career in acting? I was doing, I was at the University in Florida, and they were doing a play at the university called The Harry Ape by Eugene O'Neill. And there was a girl in the play called Faye Dunaway. We didn't know who she was at the time, of course. And I said, leave me alone. What do I know? What do I know about acting? Acting is for sissies. I'm not an actor. It's not what I do. Come on, you have to do it. You're big. You can do it. But so I did the part. It was The Harry Ape by Eugene O'Neill, a play about alienation where a man doesn't belong in society, he runs a ship. And at the end he gets killed and the curtain goes down and it was over and it was dead quiet and I figured, God, it's a disaster. And then the audience went bananas for about 20 minutes, screaming, shouting, throwing things in the air. I said, ha ha, I like it. This is what I'm gonna do. And that's I finished, nice. my, finished my degree in New England and then went to, to New York to study with Tamara Dakahanova, who was one of the great ladies of the Russian theater. And all the students in the class were actors who were doing Broadway plays and off-Broadway and doing television series, finishing school and acting. Now, the, the way it started, I am now, now I am taking classes I'm doing, I'm trying to get a job, I'm doing plays off-Broadway. I go to a party of the people who graduated Brandeis University my first year there, and somebody said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm trying to make it as a man in America. It's hard to do right now. I'd like to be someplace where people believe and are doing something. And somebody taps me on the shoulder, and I turn around. And he says, is that what you really want? I said, that's what I really want. He said, my name is Lionel Loeber, and I am personal assistant to Otto Preminger. We are doing a film in Israel called Exodus. They are all gone. They are now in Israel. I am the last one here. I have seen your work in New York on the stage. You're a fine actor. I will get you to Israel. Took out his checkbook and wrote out a check for $1,000 and handed me the check. I didn't believe it was real, but I put it in my pocket. I went to the bank the next day. They handed me $100 bills and I jumped on an airplane to Israel. I got here three days later. He said, I brought you here with my own money. They, this, is, I had, this film is my first chance. I am giving you yours. When the Israeli actors go in to meet Preminger for interviews, you'll go in also. Or you'll get a part, or you won't. If you do, you're in the film and you're in Israel. If you don't get a part in the film, at least you're here what people believe and are doing. I said, that's okay with me. I went in to see Preminger. I mean, Preminger was a... And I was a smart-ass young guy. And I said, I've come halfway around the world to be in this film, and I'm going to be in it whether you like it or not. He said, OK, I will find a part for you. Started the film career. And he said, you know, your part won't be for some time yet. I said, OK, I'll, don't worry about it. I'll find something to do. And I uh, got a job with special effects people. I got a job with the wardrobe people and the British wardrobe because I had to wait months before my part came. And my part was in Akko. I French kissed a woman through the fence. She passed a detonator from her mouth to mine. I build a bomb and blow up the prison escape. It's the part. I have a letter from Otto Preminger thanking me for my job in the film. And the day that my first day of shooting, because I knew everybody, I had worked at all the departments. My first day of shooting, the call sheet comes out. The call sheet is what you do, you work for the day, what the work and the schedule is, and who's working. And they list the actors. They listed the actors this way. Paul Smith, one. Paul Newman, two. Lee J. Cobb, three. Sal Mineo, four. I mean, come on, I was, I was just starting. I was a little kid of this whole street. I still have that call sheet. Otto Preminger was, was a very tough man. I mean, he gave me, he gave me a part, and, and I liked him very much, but he, uh, when I was doing the kissing of the woman through the fence, he reached over and pulled me and said, put your head this way. And I said, you do that once more, and I'm going to come over this fence. I'm going to wrap you in the chops and be back the way. I was a young guy. I didn't care. They said, fire me. What do I know? In 1967, you enlisted in the Israeli army and fought in the Six-Day War. I came because I knew it was coming, and this is a place I wanted to be. I wanted to help. And I went down the, to, to Jaffa to join the Israeli army, and they said, who are you? And I said, my name is Paul Smith. They said, Paul Smith? Do you speak Hebrew? No. Are you in the army? No. 
go home. We don't have any clothes for you. We have no place to put you. Go home. I went home. I felt really bad. And I, and I, and I said to my lady, look, I've got to go back and try again because, you know, they need everybody they can get. It's got to be someplace they can put me. And I went back down and I said, my name is Paris Lifshitz. I figured maybe I'd fool them. They didn't know it was false, but whatever. And I said, look, what? I said, no, you don't have to I said, what can you do? They said, what can you do? I said, I can drive a semi-trailer truck. They said, we'll find something for you to do. And the sixth day, well, I was driving semi-trailer trucks in the Sinai. After the, the, the war was over, I decided to stay in Israel and, and see if I could build a career here as, as a film actor, which is what I did. And uh, I went to the, to the producers here to try, to try and find work. And I was offered some, some jobs, but they were not that was not what, what they should have been. And I finally had a producer who said, yes, I would like to do a film with you. His name was Mikhail Shvili, who's a producer in Jerusalem. And I ended up doing three or four films for him, a very, very nice man. And a quick story in the middle of this, one, one day he came into his office and he said, Paul, I'd like to see my, meet my son. His son was four years old. And he said, Paul, one day, my son will be a director. I said, Mecha, when your son is a director, I come and I do a film for you for nothing, wherever I am. Figured that's the end of the story. 20 years go by, I've been all over the world making films everywhere. I just get home from a film and the phone rings, no, where are you? Okay, where am I? Who am I talking to? This is Mecha Shvili. You remember me from Israel? Yes. He said, Benny, my son is doing his first film. Are you coming? I said, send me tickets. I've got four weeks before my next film. I will come in, you've got the film I promised you for nothing, you've got it. And I flew in with my wife and we were here for four weeks. What was the name of that film? Operation Stremel. <laughs> Operation Stremel. <laughs> um, can you talk about working in Italy? How, how did that happen, how was it? I had just finished doing Moses here in Israel. I was working on Moses time and I became friendly with the makeup man. I like the crew. Crew and I always got along much better than actors and I. Because crew are nice people who work every day and do their job and don't get into all this whatever. And he said to me, why don't you come to Italy and do films there? I mean, you, you're ideal. Does Bud Spencer and Terrence Hill, they can be Paul Smith and somebody else. You do a team. Why don't you come? I said, when someone sends me a contract and tickets, I'll be glad to come. He said, give me some pictures, I'll take them back to me. He said, please, and actors have pictures everywhere. Everybody in the world has pictures all over, has pictures. I get a letter in the mail with a contract, film written for me, starring in, I fly to Italy. We look for blonde-haired, blue-eyed partner. We finally find someone who's very good. And I named him Michael Colby. His name is Antonio Cantafora, as Bud Spencer is Mario Giotti, and, and the other one is Carlo Pitasoli. So they're, they're Italian. I had a partner. And we did five action comedies that played all over the world that were really good. Same style. And from there, we, we went all over the world making films based out of Rome. We spent five years there, my lady and I. We went everywhere. I went, I went to the, uh, the Far East and did uh, Return of the Tiger with Bruce Lai. In Bruce Lee's last film, he said, if I don't come back to this young man, you go find out who did it. Bruce Lai is the actor who he said that to and who went on to become a star in the Far East. And I did a, uh, an action film. It was really fun. I mean, we were, we were filming in Taiwan, and I rented, I didn't want to stay in a hotel, so I rented an apartment. And in the apartment, if I sat on the toilet, my feet were in the living room because everybody comes up to your puppet, comes up to your belly button. <laughs> They, everybody was very sweet. Every day they would give me a piece of paper telling me I would go down and catch a cab in front of where I lived and they would take me to the set. Well, one day I got up, went down, got in the cab, handed them the, the thing, and uh, it was yesterday. Yesterday's set, there was nobody there. I got there, there were 18 zillion people. I couldn't talk to anybody. I, find, I find, finally found the set. Now, in the, in the Far East, the, the actors do a lot of up walls and flips and turning about and all this business. And I said to the producer, I would like to fly too. It's all done with cables. He said, Paul, there are not enough people in this whole island to get you off the ground. Come, l come lunchtime, they would only have a little, little stainless steel container with rice and some vegetables on the side. And uh, that's what they would have for lunch. And for me, they would bring 10 of them. 
<laughs> well, they, they, they don't eat very much. Don't be bigger than you know a feather. But I had a lot of lot of fun working in the, in the Far East. People were very very sweet. That was one of the places. Then then of course they were doing, at that time they were doing twenty one hours in Munich, which was a story of the Israeli athletes who were, who were killed in uh, Munich in the Olympics. And we were friends with And Andrei Spitzer and his wife Anki. So I jumped on an airplane and I flew into Germany. And uh, that's a story in itself. Because I flew into Germany when I went to go through passport control. They take your passport, they put a fence face down on the counter. There's a computer underneath that records. And they said, Mr. Smith, we'd like to talk to you. And they took me into a, to a room and said, you know that you put 28 of our citizens in the hospital. I said, I didn't know it was quite that many, but uh, this is what happened. I had gone to visit one of the concentration camps outside of Munich with a friend of mine. Wait, left a buddy of mine had come to visit. And I always wore my Jewish star. And afterwards, we came out of the camp and stopped at a beer parlor, three, four miles down the road. And there were four Germans sitting at the next table, big, big guys. And, and I guess they saw my star because one said to the other, there were two we missed in the ovens. And my friend and I quietly got up, walked over smiling, and commenced to kick serious butt. When it was over, we had destroyed the place. The police had come. People had jumped in Udim, and they jumped on up from everywhere. We spent the police. They took, they took us to the uh, hotel, picked up our bags, put us on an airplane, and flew us out of the country. Ten years later, I came back to do 20 when I was in Munich. I had forgotten about the whole thing. I didn't know what had happened. And they said 28. Citizens went to the hospital, and I don't know how many stayed in bed for how long. Are you going to behave yourself? I said, I would behave myself as much as last time. I didn't start it last time either. Anyway, went in, met with the people who were doing 21 hours in Munich, and I said, look, Paul, we don't, you know, we don't have any, we don't have the budget. We can't pay you salary. We know what you get. I said, don't worry about it. My friend, my friend was killed in Munich, and I want to be part of this project. And I played the wrestling coach in, in 21 hours in Munich. We left Europe. When Italy went from 300 films a year to 14, because they passed some laws which were very, you couldn't fire a gun on a set, the whole industry in Italy went down the tubes. Came back to me, they called me and said, would you be willing to meet David Putnam and Ellen Parker, and would you come out and meet them in California about a new film? They'd like to meet you. I said, no, I'm tired. We just got, we just come in from Europe. I'm in Boston. I'd like to show my wife some of America. Just let it go. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll do something else. Something else will come along. They called me three days later and said, would, would you meet us at the Hotel Pierre in New York? I said, New York is 200 miles from me. Yes, I will come. I will come and meet you. I walked in and I said, I will do in this film what Richard Widmark did in Kiss of Death playing Tommy Udo. I will make the audience hate me. The only thing is, I would rather do the spy in the prison than the policeman. They said, Paul, I am sure you would be a knockout spy. Incredibly good. But then who would do the warden? I don't have intercourse with people anally. I don't. I like men, but I don't sleep with them. I don't like the. I don't like the plumbing. Uh, I don't beat little kids with sticks. I'm big enough to do it without without having to use a stick. Absolutely unlike me. I said, okay, I'll do the warden. They said, by the way, would would you mind taking off your your beard and would would, would you mind taking off your your beard and all your hair? And I thought about it for a minute, because I said, I want a ball of flesh. And I said, no, I wouldn't like doing that at all. I will take the beard off. I don't know what, whatever you want to get, you'll get, that's fine. I have no problem with that. But if you make my head a ball of flesh, you give me no way to go as an actor. I need room to be able to move through the character. And if I'm, it's just, so you won't, give, you won't give me the room. All right, they agreed. Then they said, by the way, do you mind if you do it in Turkish? Do you speak, no, do you speak Turkish? I said, who speaks Turkish? Uh, would you do the part in Turkey? I'd do the part in any language you'd like. Just give me the time to learn about it, I have no problem. Okay, got it. I left, I've got the part. We now jump in the car and get to California as quick as we can, leave all our stuff, and jump on a plane to Malta where we're filming this. Come to the set first day. On the set to shoot, Alan Parker said, I want you to do this part with absolutely nothing on your face. No, no expression, no anything. Just flat, the whole part. I said, here we go again. It's like taking all the hair off. You're not giving me any room to move. I said, I'll tell you what, you have options. 
you can you can fire me. You can send me home. It's the first night you're right. You're the director of this film. You can you can fire me, or you can let me show you who this character is. You have a picture of the whole film in your head and how it goes. I know who this guy is. I have put it together. I know who he is. Let me show you what I know, and then do what you want. Look at them both, and you decide which one you want. Or send me home. You have the option. Filmed his, filmed mine, finished. He said, thank you very much. I did mine the rest of the film. I never heard anything more than good day, Miss. Good morning, Mr. Smith. Good evening, Mr. Smith. He's a hell of a good director. We just, I knew I, knew I was right. And there are times when you know you're right. You have to stick by your guns. Because had it been the other way, it would have been wrong. It would have been like every other villain that ever was. I didn't want that to happen. And he was smart enough to see that that what I was that what I was talking about was that I had that I had the right hold on the part. Well, that's why you hire me. You hire an actor because you know what he can do, and then you try and bring it out. Every single part I do is the same. A script starts at some point in the in the life of the character you're playing. I have to recreate the life from when this person was born until he enters the first page of the script. My friend said to me, when I did Hamidou in Midnight Express, if you dropped me with the Eskimos in Alaska, I would still be Hamidou. Because I psychologically build the character so he never gets lost. He's always there. So I, I was ready. I'm, before I walk on the set the first day, not only do I know my whole part already, but I built the whole character and I'm ready, ready to go. I, do my, I take it very seriously. It's not a game. It's what I love doing, what brings me to life. And it's my, that's my thing. And how was it working on Midnight Express? I had a real problem because I, I put this thing together, these pieces together of, of doing who this guy was, and I had to hold on to them. I, it was like a puzzle under pressure. I had to keep holding it together so it didn't fly apart. I had to get out of the hotel. I couldn't be with the other actors. And, and the, uh, the, the producer, the, the assistant producer, Alan Marsh, came to me and said, Paul, the other actors are afraid of you. I said, that's very good. It must be, must, must be, must be working. First day, I have to work with the two little kids in that movie. I'm in makeup. And the two little kids that are with me in Midnight Express come bopping in, happy and smiling. And even my wife is standing next to me. And she knows I'm about to, to have a great time. Because she said, don't. When they got to me, I went, Rawr! And the kids ran. And they were so scared of me, that whole film, you could see them. Every time they were with me, they were. And that's what you wanted. Couldn't explain, you can't explain to little kids how to give you that. They gave me that. Anyway, we came back to Hollywood. We spent we spent time. They worked in Hollywood. And I wanted to show my wife America. So I figured if we get out to Hollywood, I've done enough work so that you know I would have, you know, somebody would know who I was. At the same at the same time that that, that I was offered the part of Bluto and Popeye, I was offered a, a part to do in the in the remake of The Postman Always Rings Twice, to do the, the, the husband. And I had to decide which one I was going to, to do it with. And I had, it, was, it was a struggle until I finally, finally came to the decision that, that I would do Popeye. And we spent six months, six months or more, working on the film in Malta. The extras were a lot of fun. The extras were all from the Pickle Street Circus. So they were street performers, and they were all really, really good, very, very talented. Robin was, was fun to work with, and although he was very, very fast and very quick when we were filming, he was very quiet when we were, when we were not filming. You know, he, was, he was the lead of the film. It's a very important part, and I understand it's, an, it's another medium. Film is a different medium from television, and uh, he had done television. I've done his series, Mork and Mindy. But he was a nice guy. I, I enjoyed working with, with them. It's very, it's very hard to do a, a cartoon character because you don't know exactly where you, how it trans... Because everyone, you, when you see a cartoon, you translate it into your head to your own images. But you're on screen, the images are there, and you have to try and make them work. And I had a film to do in, in Italy, and Popeye was three months late. And it was a film with Tony Quinn. It was called The Salamander from a book by Morris West, American producer who kept calling and saying, Paul, when are you finishing? I'm holding this part for you. You know, After three months, he said, Paul, 
If you're not in here tomorrow, I've got to get somebody else. We need, that. we need to finish doing this film. We were in the tank, which is a city block round tank, which you do underwater, which you do water things in Malta. And Robin got hurt, and they were going to stop the shooting and continue to run. Robin said, no, finish it and let Paul get the hell out of here. Cut, jumped out of the, out of the, the, the tank, soaking wet, into the cab. He was waiting. Our bags were there. Stripped naked in the cab, drove to the airport, got dressed on the way to the airport, caught the, the, the plane running. It was about to leave. Got into Rome. The limo was waiting. Got Rome, to, limo, to makeup. Did makeup, changed clothes, walked on the set and was growling. And he said, Paul, no, 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 it's not Bluto. It's another movie. When I finished doing the film Popeye, I went on tour. Shirley Duvall and I and Eve went on tour to Japan. And we spent a month in Japan on tour because Toho Toei, the largest Japanese film, was involved in, in the film for, the, for that part of the world. And when they said to me, Mr. Smith, what, we saw press. My agreement was for every day that I saw press, I'd have a day off because we wanted to see Japan, wanted to get to know it. And they said, Mr. Smith, the press said, Mr. Smith, what would you like to do? What would the next thing you would like, what would you like to do most? I said, I am prepared to serve coffee on a Kurosawa set. Hands down, nobody touched him in this world or ever has. And at, up until that time, he had never worked with a foreign actor. I said, I would just like to be on the set and watch him work. I mean, his work is something that, that, that never ceases to amaze me. I look at it and say, whew. Unfortunately, he's gone. I would not mind doing a film with De Niro. As, as an he's actor. really class, as an actor. He's really class. Let's talk about pieces a bit. <laughs> Producer Dick Randall came to me and said, Paul, I am doing a film in Spain. Your presence would help me sell the film. I'd like you to read the script and see what you think about doing Willard. I read the script and I said, look, Dick, um, Bloody horror and, pe and things in pieces and cut up are not really my cup of tea. Can you keep, can you keep Willard away from the blood? I mean, we won't tell them that we're not the bad guy. But can you do that? He said, of course I can. Acting is something where if I was rich, I would pay the producers to let me do because it turns on my motors. I said, sure, I'll do it for you, Dick. Flew into Spain, and it was, it was, it was fun. The, the, the people were fun. Edmund Purdom had starred in The Student Prince and many other films. He was a very, very well-known actor. Working with Edmund Purdom was, was really fun because he was a, a real pro of, of the group of actors in the film. He probably uh, had as much experience, if not more, than, than he was a, a young lead in his younger days and, and had done many, many films and was well-respected as an actor. Is this job dangerous? Very. Good. Then I'll do it. I am bored to tears with this place. Chris George and Linda Day, it was actually Linda Day George, it was his wife. Chris had a series called The Desert Rats, which is a military series, and she had worked as well. They were all well-known actors. There was a young man called Ian Serra. It was his first film, and I tried to help him. He was a very, ta very talented young man, and I th hopefully went on to make a very, made a very large career for himself because he was very good. Kendall, where are you? Uh. What happened? Another one. In the locker room. It's Susie Bellix. And they, they were all fun. We loved Spanish food. We loved going out. We went out with the crew. And we, had a, we really had a nice time. It was fun doing it. As Dick promised, I avoided the blood. I am the red herring. You think I did it. Well, I'm not telling you whether I did it or not. But anyway, I stayed away from most of the blood. And I, and I did the project, and I enjoyed it. It was fun doing. Dick Randall became a friend of mine over the years. In fact, he probably lived 150 meters from where I lived in, in Rome. And we, we became friends. He was a very, 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 very funny little man. He reminded me of Bud Abbott or Lou Costello or whatever, whichever. Little round, chubby guy who made, who made me laugh, and it was very sweet. 
And whenever he went into his office, his, his desk was piled two feet high with files. Never could, you know, and he could find he did, and then he got sick. And when he got sick, he closed the office. We had the keys. We went in. We got it. We got some. We brought someone in to set up a whole filing system. Took everything off his desk. Put everything in order. Put everything away. Came back. Couldn't find a thing. Within a week, everything was back on the desk. You'd say, Dick, remember the film in 1945 that you sold to Afghanistan? Oh yes. And there, there it was. I mean, it was incredible. That's Dick Randall. Is there a scene in it that you like? A little action scene with me by the, by the pool was fun to do. It was fun. Because I, I, like, I like doing action. No, this is, they come to arrest me. I'm the gardener. And we're by the pool. And I rip them off the wall and into the swimming pool and all that. So we just always, action was always fun for me to do. I like doing. I think people talk too much in movies. I think they should talk on radio and do on films. The Germans talk too much. Anyway, I was, that was fun to do. Every, everybody was nice. Hold it! Or I'll blow your brains out. Spain is such a nice place to work. People are very, very considerate. The Spanish crew are very professional. They work, they work very hard. They work very quickly. And they, they use the same system that the Italians use, where they shoot with four cameras, which is very unusual, because the Americans don't, know, don't do that. But I, but I like, I like the... Uh, I like the use of four cameras. Were there any difficulties communicating on the set with the Spanish crew or between people? Or I found that a smile and a thank you in any language always works. They do their work and I thank them for it. Everyone needs applause. Willard, when do you expect your work will be finished here with us on the campus? I don't know, maybe in a week or two, maybe more. You don't have to worry, it won't cost you any more. On some films, I had the opportunity to do my own dubbings on other films I didn't want to. But it was, it was very interesting because you would be doing a movie working with five actors, each one speaking his own language. So it's a little difficult to do a serious scene when everybody's speaking something that you don't know. But you get used to it. So, sometimes yes and sometimes no, depending where I was and if I had the time to do it. Because you would finish a film and you'd be off doing another one. The sooner you finish here, the sooner you'll be able to, to accept another job elsewhere. I think that's only good business, that's wouldn't you say? Sure. I'll be as quick as I can. As far as the film itself goes, although I am not a, uh, an expert on horror films, I, am, I feel sure that it probably ranks um, with, with the top rank of horror films in, in the world today. I think that uh, it has that possibility. Although remember, I am not, that's not my expertise. Uh, I, think it, I think it stands very well. The original name of pieces was Jigsaw. And I like that very much. I don't know why they changed the name. Maybe they thought that the, that, that the, the first part of maybe Jig had something to do with the racial implications. I have no idea why they changed the name. But I think that I, I, there's nothing wrong with the pieces, but Jigsaw is a knockout. Somebody else will find it. There were lots of very scary things in the movie. I'm not, I, you know, I'm not, I don't want to be scared. <laughs> Do you like horror movies in general? Not at all. I mean, are, are there any horror movies you like? Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. The Exorcist, which I think is a great, great horror film. I have a collection of CDs. I, I probably have 2,000 DVDs, rather. Probably 2,000 even movies. And uh, I, I called my friend, a director in, in Hollywood, and I said, uh, you do these kind of films. Would you please tell me the five top horror films, for instance, and he, and he did, and you know, I put them in the, I bought them and put them in my library. Pieces was not among them, but he enjoyed Pieces, and you know, I think for, for, its, for, its, for its genre, I think that it's, it's very good, I think it's very weird, I think it's very far, I think it should work. Did you like it? Ah! It was a little, little violent for me, I, mean, I haven't cut up anybody lately into Pieces, I don't know, but. Uh, I looked at it with one eye because as the blood started flowing, I said, wait, wait, here we go. <laughs> and the other eye got smaller as it got bloodier. Did you make it till the end? I said, I have to see it. There's no way that I cannot go till the end and see it. So I saw it. I saw it. I did see it till the end. 
Who did you see it with? My lady. Your lady? Did she like it? Did your wife like the movie? Ah! <laughs> How do you feel about violence in movies in general? I think, believe it, listen, most of, most of my career has been action films, and I really love doing action films. I have, a, I have a real problem because I believe, I believe, and I hate, I hate saying this, I believe that violence in the film is adding to the violence outside in the world. Now, you may, you may not agree with me, but in movies, you get shot, you get up, you make another movie. Kid, little kids who don't understand that you're not dead, that you're only making a movie, the blood, the... Look at the insanity that's happening in the world. I mean, I don't, I don't know if we are not a not the sole contributor, but a partial contributor to their violence. And that makes me unhappy because I love doing action films. I never had a double work for me in a film. I did all my own actions. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna cheat the audience. I had a double in every film, it never worked. They he said, let me work. I said, what are you, okay? you're getting paid. I would rather they see my front than your back. I take that back on one film, the end of Popeye, for the end credits, Someone, I had to swim straight out to sea about a mile while they ran all the end credits of the film. And I said to my devil, you want to work? You got it. <laughs> I had such a ball on Dune. I just cannot tell you how much, of, first of all, when I went in for the meeting with, with David Lynch and Dino De Laurentiis and Raphael sitting at the meeting, they wanted me to do The Baron. And they said, but we'd like you to put on 100 pounds. And I said to myself, I ain't going to do that. Because as big as I am, another 100 pounds will put me in a box. I said, I'd love to be in the movie, but I'm, I'm not. They didn't want to build a suit. In the end, they built a suit for, for the guy who did the Baron. But they didn't want to build a suit. They wanted me. And I said, no, I would. I just, you know, it's going to kill me. I don't want don't to do that. So I did The Nephew. Now, I loved doing the film. I had more fun on that film, and it was a tough film. Because you were wearing doe skin zip-on against your skin, then the costumes were plastic and rubber, and they didn't stretch. And we were in Mexico City, and it was 105, 110, 100 and whatever. It was terrible. Now, some, some great stories on that, some really good stories. That, that was a scene where I'm in a, a steel bathtub, and someone comes in and tells me Moadib, who is the lead, is killing everybody. I get angry and I punch through these lights above me and this black rain in the tub covers me. We get ready to shoot it and Kit West, who's won an Oscar for special effects, probably the best in the world. Kit sent a letter to Rafaela De Laurentiis saying, we, myself and my crew, am not going to shoot this scene because there's a chance that he will get electrocuted, that something can go wrong, because he's in a metal tub, and the way this thing is set up, there's no guarantee that he will not be seriously hurt, and we're not going to do it, and they didn't do it. She didn't know about it, they told her, and she said, we just take, we take the scene out. Now, they were all going off to the desert. All, they found a place in Juarez to shoot some of the scenes, and, and the, the sand was like in Bojest. The sand runs like water. You know, the sand dunes with it. I have this scene. I'm supposed to go up this, walk up the sand dune and stop and look around and say these lines. We're going to, we're going to conquer this planet, etc. Well, first of all, it's 18 billion degrees hot outside. They've got to bring us out in, in, in uh, motorcycles with big tires for sand because otherwise nothing moves. And he says, action, and I start up the sand dune, and as I'm going up, the sand is going down, and I ain't going anywhere. I'm going, but I'm not moving. So I get a little bit, get halfway there, and I stop. I look around. I'm the boss. I can do it. I look around, the shooting. And I start again, and I do, I do the lines. Okay. Now comes time for close-ups, etc. It is terribly hot. People have been passing out all day. It is so terribly hot. So I take the bottom half off, and I leave the top half of my costumes on it, and they're in a close. They're shooting here. I start my lines, and the sand starts coming out from under the heels of my feet. So I start sinking. But an actor can't say cut, and you're in a close-up. You're not allowed to move. The camera's just close. You move, you out of the frame. So I'm doing, I'm sinking. I can't say I'm sinking. I'm sinking. Next thing you know, I'm... I come at the cut. 
Okay, we get back up, we put the pants back on, they want to do some medium shots. And I suddenly feel like I'm going to vomit and go to the bathroom in my pants at the same time I know I'm going out. I'm not going to pass out. There's no question. People have been passing all day. It's terrible. I hit the deck, and the Time Life photographer from Time Life magazine was on the set. And I heard his motorized Nikon going click, 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 click. And I said, I will be damned if I let that bastard stick my paper and time to look passed out on the sand. I'm getting up. <laughs> I got up. It's went through your head. Funny things go through your head. I got up and, and we filmed it and everything was fine. But the de- that the whole thing was my fault because I said that to David Lynch, David, they're all going to the desert. How come I'm not going to the desert? You guys are filming this. I'm not going. The crew said, Paul, you don't want to go. You don't want to go. Don't go. You won't. David, how come I'm not going to the desert? Okay. They took, now I understood afterwards why they didn't, you didn't want to go to the desert. Now I'm doing, doing another scene in the movie. And I, I go in to see my, my, my uncle. I said, David, you know, the, the scene in the spaceship, when I go down the car, is very empty. Shouldn't we do something? He said, let me think about it. Two days later, he comes back, Sam and Judy, he said, Paul, what can you do with a cow? I said, a cow? I said, hey, what do you do with the cow? I can milk him. I can carry him. I don't know what you do with a cow. Something. He said, don't worry. You'll have a cow. A cow? What are you doing with a cow? Okay. I come to the set. There is a full-grown, dead, frozen cow hanging upside down on chains. And there are midgets pushing him with a stick. And his head is wrapped in a bandage and his tongue is hanging out. This dead cow. He said, now what can you do with a cow? I said, geez, what can you do with a cow? You don't know what to do with the cow. I said, I can always take out his tongue and eat it. He said, you got it. I said, what? He said, you got it. Colin, the special effects guy, they, they take out the cow's tongue. They chip out the teeth. The cow is dead. It's frozen, upside down. They take out his tongue. They take a plastic sleeve. They cook the tongue. They said, how do you like the tongue? I said, sweet and sour. If I have to eat it, I might as well like it. They cook the tongue and they stick it inside of this plastic sleeve. The end is blocked off. And they stick the whole thing in the cow's mouth. So I come walking down the car. I see the cow. I hit a midget and knock him into the trough. I put my hand in the cow and I tear out the tongue. And I walk in to see my, see my uncle eating this tongue. It's disgusting. But David is very, with a very strange head. The, David Lynch, I love him, very strange. We had five full units with five directors shooting full time for six months. We had three kitchens. We had an American kitchen and chef. We had a, 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 a Spanish cook and chef, and we had an Italian cook and chef. So you could eat any, you know, there were five full crews. You got to feed them somewhere. And we had, we took the whole studio, we took the whole of Cherubusco studio. One more quick story and I will leave Dune. We fly in to Mexico City. And we're invited, we're flying on a, on a Friday, and, and on Sunday there's a, a, a pool party. And everybody's there, they're, they're mostly actors there, and all the crew, and all the, the big shots, and so forth, and so on. And I walk in, and, and I walk up to Rafaela, and Rafaela said, uh, you think you, you were going to like working with the dealer? Says, I said, yes. She said, you think you might like to work with us again? I said, yes. She said, throw that lady in the pool. I look over, there's a lady dressed to the tens, alligator shoes, watch. Dressed beautifully, blonde hair coiffed. I walked over, I, I said, excuse me, but you and I are going in the pool, so if you want to get rid of your shoes, I went, ah! I jumped in the pool. She was the head of publicity that, for the film. That day, I probably threw in half of the, half of the crew and half of the weather because she wanted me to. It was just playing. I said, well, the only actor in history is going to go to work tomorrow. I'm going to have no publicity, no focus, no, no, no nothing, no, because nobody's going to talk to me. Six years go by, we jump from this story. They're doing a film called Red Sonja with Arnold Schwarzenegger, and she's producing. And I walked in, and she said, you remember that conversation we had five years ago? I said, yes. She said, you're hired. That was a good throw. (laughs) Can you talk about working on Crime Wave with Sam Raimi? Crime Wave was, a, was an interesting, interesting sort of film. 
whew, it was snowing. I know we were Chicago, Detroit, wherever we were, it was free, freezing cold. I mean, everybody was freezing. I was okay. I love that. I go like this in the winter when it's snowing. I like it. But it was really freezing cold. I didn't, there was, for me, it was not difficult working in Detroit at all. I had a ball. Everybody, when we filmed at night on the bridge and over the water and in the water, everybody was wearing down pants and down tops and down whatever. I was in shorts as I am today and in a short sleeve shirt, and I loved it. But I'm, I'm related to the whales. I like, I like the cold and I'm always in the hot. Brian James was my partner in the film. We were together and we were exterminators. People thought rat exterminators, but really people. It's not, a bad, it's, not a, it's not a bad film at all. But it was one of the films where I have a scene where, I, where I've got a body in a sack and I'm coming out of the building. We've just electrocuted him. And a blind man with a stick comes up and, and threatens me with a stick and I'm afraid of him. I said, Sam, give this whole scene to Brian James because he's a ratty character who'd be afraid of his grandmother. I said, if a blind man came up to me with a stick, I would take the stick, break it in two, eat him, and then use his blind man stick to pick my teeth. That's who the character is. There's no way that I'm going to be afraid of a guy, unless you want to show a flashback when I was three being frightened by a blind man. He said, Paul, you're giving away a whole scene. I said, no, it's where it belongs. We gave it, we gave it, we gave it to Brian. There was, uh, there was another major scene with rats. And I said, Sam, I think it's a good idea because I don't think that, that you have the people here you want me in with a million rats and something or other, there ain't no way you can stop them from biting me, doing whatever you're doing. I just don't want to do it. I don't think that it makes sense. We don't need it, and we don't know how to do it. It's not one rat, two rats, three rats, it's about a thousand rats and something. It's just not, you know, they're not going to do what I want them to do. That's for sure. I don't care who your animal trainer is. So we dev devised another thing, and it, it worked out very well. Did you get along with Sam Raimi? I got along, I got along with Sam fine. He was, still, he was still feeling his way. He was a friend of the Coen brothers, and, and he was still feeling, was still very early in his career. But I enjoyed doing it, and the review in Variety, which I have, says Paul Smith single-handedly kept this film afloat. It's in Variety, I have the quote. I have watched Sam Remy grow as a director, and it would be my pleasure to work with him again. I think he's a, I think he's a real talent. I think that he grew into it and has serious stature now as a director. The Schwarzenegger film was fun. I will tell you, he's an awfully nice guy. Arnold is. The, the way I did the, got the part in Red Star, I had to explain to you, it was after Dune, some years later, I walked in and Rafael Durantes was producing the film. Directed by Richard Fleischer, who had done The Vikings, a lot of other great films, really fine director. And I had something that, that happened the first time in my career, and I've been and it's almost 50 years I've been doing this now. Richard Fleischer called in the whole cast, and he said, ladies and gentlemen, no one on this crew will ever say to you, speak louder or speak softer. No one will say, move to the right or move to the left. We will discover the truth of this movie between us, the actors. When we have found it, we will call in the crew, and the head of the departments who were not there, only actors with him. We will show it to them. It is their job to get what you do. It's their job. If you speak softly, it's their job. They don't want to hide the mics and have the time to do it. If the camera wants you to move, move the damn camera. Don't move the actors. The, the crew's job is to get the performance. And we will show them what we have when we discover it, which I found very good because it's very hard to play a moving scene we really want to be very soft and gentle and tender, and the sound man saying, speak louder, or the cameraman guy says, move to the left, you're not in the light, move the damn light. Anyway, it, it was fun. Arnold was most certainly fun to work with. He's got a great sense of humor. He brought his gym with him from the States, so we worked out every, every morning. We laughed, we had, a, we had a ball. It was a fun, fun film to do. We were back in Italy, and I mean, we had lived in Italy, so we had lived in Italy for five years, so we were back there again working. There was a scene in Red Sonia where Arnold was fighting a monster in the water, and I wondered how they were going to do this scene. Dino De Lourdes has a studio that had been closed for years, and we opened it again for this film in, in Rome. 
and you walk in and they blow a whistle and then suddenly this enormous studio the floor starts to sink and it goes down 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 and suddenly you're up to water up to your mm, which is incredible i'd not seen that before a hydraulic stage which set in the water which was which was really fun to work with and Arnold had such a, such a sense of humor. We did so much laughing. He had four doubles with him, but I mean, you have to do that. You can't afford to. Uh... I was in my own work. The problem is the, they really didn't like it because if you get hurt, the movie stops. I mean, if Arnold got hurt doing one of these things, we'd have no, we'd have no movie. Three quarters of the way through, this, through, through the movie Red Sonia, Christmas came. And Dino said, I'm not keeping all you actors in Italy. So I just took all the script, just took out the pages. We're not shooting those. He's the boss, he's the producer. But we had, we had, we had lots of fun doing it. And Bridget Nielsen was, was the lady, and she later married Stallone, and then later went on, whatever she did, she went on and did her thing. But it was, it was a fun film with, with lots of nice people in Italy. Is, the food is so good, you have to like Italy. During, during my career of 50 some odd years, maybe a little more, every film I did, I always had my wife standing next to the camera. Why did I do that? Because she knew if I was faking or not. And if she didn't like the take, she would very just give me a little sort of wink. And I would say to the director, when he said cut print, I'd say, Ex excuse me, but you know, I really could do it better. It didn't feel right. Can I have another take? And I would do it again. Because I knew that my, was right there watching, looking after me. And it, it worked out really fine. It worked out well. Now I'd like to quickly tell you about a film called, Haunt, called Haunted Honeymoon. I do a film with, Gene Wilder, which is called The Frisco Kid, which is a story of a rabbi who leaves Poland, comes to San Francisco, and goes across the West to meet the lady he's supposed to marry. And then on the way to the West, he meets with Harrison Ford, who's a gunfighter who takes him along the way. Okay, Robert Aldrich, very, very, very famous director, is directing. And there are seven leading major world-known actors on the trip from Poland to San Francisco. This is the, the, the orthodox group, group of people who are traveling with Gene because he's a rabbi coming across. Finish the film, I get a call from the studio, Paul, we have a problem. What is the problem? The film is 20 minutes too long. So we've decided to take out the whole journey from Poland to San Francisco and the film will open with, with you getting off the boat with the other people and Gene crossing and all up, the whole voyage is gone. Do you want us to leave your name in the film? I mean, you're only there to wave goodbye to him. I said, no, take out my name. I don't want to leave my name in the film. I don't want to cheat anybody. Fully not realizing that I just passed up a whole bunch of residuals, because if your name is not in the credits, you don't, you're not, that doesn't happen to be the case. 10 years go by and we are now in Rome. And we're sitting in, in Piazza del Popolo having coffee. And look, up in front of us is standing Gene Wilder and Gildner Radner. They're in Rome for, for their honeymoon. And he said, why don't you go say hello to Gene? You used to be friends with him. I said, no. She said, go to Okay. I went up and said, Gene, how are you? We talked about Rome. He introduced me to Gilda. I told him about restaurants because obviously I had nowhere to eat. He said, we're doing a film in London in September. Don't call, don't write. You'll get a script. We'll see you. I said, fine, good. Hello, goodbye. They left. I left. I figured another story is, goes by. We finished what we're doing in Rome. I had an Italian film to do. I fly back to the States. Come. End of June, beginning of August, out of July, beep, 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 it's a rap at the door. They hand me a script, a script from Gene Wilder. I'm doing a film and I'm doing a film with him in London. I get a call from the wardrobe department in London saying, Mr. Smith, we need to make costumes for you. Uh, we're going to make your clothes. Would you please tell me your neck size? I said, I have to tell you in inches because I don't know. You're going to make me shirts and coats and things. I said, yes, it's 24. She said, what? I said, 24, my neck is 24 inches, that's its size. I hear her talking in the back, like 24. I hear all these people around, she's obviously in the costume room. Uh, Mr. Smith, what is your jacket size? I said, 68. She said, what? I said, 68, what do you want from me? Mr. Smith, would you and your wife like to come to London a week early as our guests. We will take care of everything because we got to see this. We got to make your clothes. And nobody's ever seen those numbers before. I said, okay. So we flew it. We flew into London and they made the clothes. It was really nice. And, and Don DeLuise and I had, 
had dressing rooms next to one another. So Dom and I talked recipes nonstop and food night and day. We were filming. And it was a big studio. We filmed at Elstree, so they got us a golf cart. And if you can imagine, Dom DeLuise and I in a golf cart. If you know what a speedboat looks like when it's up in the water, this golf cart, the front wheels were off the ground and the back wheels, and people would applaud as we drove by because it was a... Gene, was, it was a fun film to work with. Gene Wilder was really a, a sweetheart. He walked, I have a scene that I have to play with my wife in the movie. We're unpacking and she's bothering me about something. And I am the psychiatrist, his uncle, who has been brought in to straighten out his head. Gene walks up, puts his arm on me and says, Paul, tomorrow you're going to have an audit by the IRS. Somewhere in your suitcase that you're unpacking are the papers. If you don't find them, you're going to jail. That's what I want you to play. It's got nothing to do with the movie. None of that's in the movie. Mm -hmm. He said, that's the feeling I want to get from what you're doing. So I did. I mean, I was unpacking and she was going on and I was going through this and it just worked out because he's an actor. He also was a director. But he understood how to get from someone what he wanted, the, the colors that he wanted. I said, Gene, I can be very funny in this film. My part lends to be very funny. He said, Paul, I got a cast full of comedians. I got me, I got my wife, I've got Don DeLuise, I've got all these people from England, I have all these acting role comics. He said, no, I want you to be straight. You're the psychiatrist, and I want you to be the straight in this movie. And we had, we had a great time. We had the best schedule I have ever had in my life. I had four weeks of shooting, five weeks not shooting, one day shooting. So we rented a house and had the most lovely time in London. And Jean was a lot of fun, and so was Gilda. I'm sorry she's gone. And it was nice working with, with Jean and Dom, and it was a fun film to do. And I ate things like Spotted Dick and all these weird things that they have in England to eat. I don't know what they are to this day, but it was fun. The original way that Sonny Boy came about was very strange indeed. I had done a, prom a prom promo for a film that I wanted to do, which, which involved a large, white, tough cop and, and someone from, from Asia, from China or Japan, another policeman. They don't know either one of the, each one is a policeman. They get together, one goes to arrest the other in the middle of a major battle, and they find out they're both cops, and then, then the, 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 the white cop's boss says, you now have a partner, it's his oriental cop which I really didn't want. And, and this was a really, really nice story to do. And we did the promo for it. And they went to Khan and raised the money to do a film. They then changed directors and the director decided rather than having a large white cop, they wanted to have a large black cop. I don't make the rule, that's what they decided. So I said to the producer very quietly, listen, I, uh, you raised the money on me to do this film and you're not gonna do it. You have an agreement with me to do this film next money. I would like you to find something for me to do. Otherwise, I'm gonna take you to court. It's very simple. I mean, you raised your money in my name. I did this promo for you for nothing so you could raise the money, which you did. So we thought of it and said, okay, I'll send you three scripts and you can have your choice which one you wanna do. So he sent me one, we didn't like it terribly. He sent me two, we didn't like it. Sent me the third one, I was not in love with it. But then he sent me the list of actors. And when I saw who was in the film, I said, hey, these are people I like. Maybe, they, maybe there's something here that I'm not seeing. And, you know, the lead, I'm doing the lead in the picture. The picture is my picture, it's a lead. So I thought about it and talked to them and said, okay, I'll, I'll do Sunny Boy, and we did it. There was a cast of very serious actors. And David Carradine, they said, would you like to play the woman or the man? They gave me the choice because it's a couple. And one is in drag, who's very weird, and the other one is straight. I said, no, no, let David be my wife. Let David be David Carradine. So he said, okay, dress in drag. It's a really, you want to tell you about, it's about a weird picture. That's a picture. I would re-edit that movie and it would be one, tch, one heavy duty picture that's really weird. They raise this, we raise this kid, we find, we live in the country. 
and we have a farm and the people steal stuff and bring it to us to sell. And one of the cars where they kill the people, they find a baby and they want to feed them to the pigs. And I, he says, no, I want, I want to keep the baby. And so we have a baby and we bring up this child. Really weird, really weird, this little child. This whole movie is very, not many people can say they were David Carradine's husband. 